Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the previous lecture, I introduced to you Euler equations. They are the first type of differential equations, at least through this lecture series, that we have seen that have a singular point in them. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use that knowledge, we're going to leverage it, and we're going to build it up to looking at series solutions around points that are singular in our second order differential equations. This is going to be called the Frobenius method. Uh, it leads to power series that are sort of non-traditional. They're slightly different than what you might be used to. Uh, and in particular, we call them Frobenius uh, series. Now, before we can get there, we need to all be sort of talking about exactly the same thing. So let's start by introducing what we call a regular singular point. So remember, there's ordinary points. That's what we focused on with the series solutions originally. Then there are singular points, and there are two different kinds underneath that. There are regular, which we'll focus on here, and there are irregular, which we will not focus on. So what is a regular singular point? A regular singular point. Well, we are always going to be talking about differential equations that look like this. u of x y prime plus r of x y is equal to zero. And of course, we have to assume that we have a singular point. So that means that we are focused around some root of p. Remember, if it wasn't a root of p, then it's a regular point and life is good. We can just do regular old series. You can handle it. Now, if we're going to define some limits, we're going to say the limit as x goes to x0, so it's from both left and right, of x minus x0 of, uh, sorry, q of x, pardon me, p is in the denominator, divided by p of x. And the limit as x goes to x naught of x minus x naught squared r of x over p of x. If both of these limits exist, then x naught is a, let's put it in a different color so it really pops, a regular singular point. And then otherwise, of course, it is irregular. Okay, so we have this kind of weird limit definition that tells us when we have a regular singular point. Now, before we sort of walk towards what this actually means, let's, you know, let's look at a differential equation. Let's ask ourselves, you know, what are the singular points and are they regular or irregular? Now, I'm gonna focus on a very particular differential equation, a very, very famous one. It's so famous that it's named after the person who studied it, named after the French mathematician Legendre. And in this case, it is one minus x squared, uh, y double prime, and then uh, minus two x y prime, and then plus alpha times alpha plus one, y is equal to zero. Now, this differential equation is extremely important. It comes up in the study of partial differential equations, something that I hope that you will move on to after you complete this course. For the time being, we'll be sort of agnostic about its applications. We're gonna look at this thing just as a second order differential equation. Alpha in here is a parameter. It can just be any real number. Now, the first thing we want to ask ourselves are what are the singular points? Well, singular points are defined when p is equal to zero. So that tells us that the singular points are x equal to plus or minus one. That's the only time when this p of x factor is equal to zero. So let's look at 
x equal to positive 1, all right? So let's do the first limit here. Well, the limit as x goes to 1 of, now, we're multiplying in a factor here, so x minus x naught, that's an x minus 1 term. And then times q of x, that's negative 2x. And now divided by 1 minus x squared. So in this case, we've got some common factors being divided off, right? This is the beauty of multiplying in this root up here. It's going to take off one of the roots of p of x. In this case, it's going to leave us with 2x over 1 plus x, which in this case is a perfectly realizable limit, and so therefore this thing is equal to 1. So that's good. Check. One of my limits exists, so I am one step closer to this thing being a regular singular point. Let's do the other limit. The limit as x goes to 1 of x minus 1 squared, so a double root that's being multiplied in here, times r of x, this is alpha times alpha plus 1, and then this is divided by 1 minus x squared. Now what you can see is that one of your roots is going to be canceled with this x minus 1, just like it was previously, but one of the roots up here is going to stay. And so this thing is going to be zero. But all that matters is that both of these, these limits exist. So both exist. Which implies x equal to 1 is a regular singular point. Okay, we don't really know what the utility of this is yet. I haven't gotten that far. But... At least it fits the de definition. At least we found one out in the wild. And in particular, you could do the same thing for x equal to minus 1. You'll find that it too is a regular singular point. Now, what's the point, right? Why is it that we actually care that this thing is a regular singular point, right? We f we, I have convinced you that we can at least find them in the wild. But the question is, what can we do with them? Why is it important to classify singular points as regular or irregular? Well, here's the idea. What we can see is that if these limits exist, then this function, so this thing, x minus x naught, q of x, divided by p of x, well, this thing is analytic at x equal to x naught. Remember what it means to be analytic. This was the fundamental criteria of being able to get series solutions. Analytic means that you have a power series representation and that power series representation can be, I, I mean, it has a radius of conversions, right? We gave an example of something that has infinite derivatives but doesn't have a radius of conversions. So in this case, this thing is analytic. It is very important. I can write this, this function as a power series, and it comes from the fact that this limit actually exists. Similarly, of course, since the other limit exists, we can do the same thing over there. So this thing is also analytic. At x equal to x naught. Okay, so now you're thinking to yourself, um, that's great, Jason. I still don't quite see why you're so excited about this. But here's what I want to do. I want to take my differential equation right here. I'm going to divide it by p of x. I can get p of x on the bottom. That's good. I'm going to multiply it through by x minus x naught squared. So divide ODE that's this ODE, of course, by P of X, and multiply by X minus X naught squared. Okay, so, so what's, the, uh, what's the excitement here? Okay, well, I get X minus X naught squared, 
times y double prime, because I divided off the p of x, plus, now, I'm going to have an x minus x naught q of x divided by p of x, and I'm going to have an extra x minus x naught in there. So x minus x naught, because I multiplied in two of them, I'm going to leave one outside, and I'm going to put this thing in right here. So I'm going to write it all like this. Uh, Q of X divided by P of X, right? And what's interesting about this is that thing is now analytic at X naught, and that is just a polynomial. Polynomials are always analytic. So two analytic functions multiplied together, still an analytic function. Good, I love it. So the reason I, I segregated this or I isolated it is because I wanted you to really use this right here. And you can see exactly what's going to happen next too, because I'm going to get plus x minus x naught squared, and then uh, r of x divided by p of x times y is equal to zero. Again, an analytic function. That is lovely. So that means that I can get series solutions to this thing. I, this, this is very much a possible uh, function because everything now is analytic out front. That means that series solutions exist. And in particular, what we know is the limit. So let's look at uh, the limit as x goes to x naught. Sorry. Let's do this. I just want to show you where these Euler equations from the previous uh, lecture pop up. Well, if we call this one, let's call this one P0, and let's call the other one Q0, okay? Again, these things are analytic. They have to exist. Again, by the assumption that these are regular singular points. And so let's call this Q naught. So then if I expand this, so near x minus x naught, the ODE becomes, now here's the real magic, it's going to be x minus x naught squared y double prime plus x minus x naught p naught y prime plus q naught y is equal to zero. Okay, so all I did is I just replaced these things with their first term in their expansions, right? Remember, we saw that if we're gonna do a series uh, solutions to these things, we need series expansions. What I did is I just truncated at the lowest possible order. Now, don't get thrown off by the shifts here, but this is an Euler equation. That Euler equation has solutions y is equal to the absolute value of x to the power of r. So what this actually does is it motivates us to use what's called the Frobenius method. And the Frobenius method, so the Frobenius method says, well, that we should look for solutions that look like this. X minus X naught to the power of R, that's solving the Euler equation. But of course, I have to expand these things as series, so I have to expand at higher and higher orders. So I'm not going to just do this. I'm going to take a constant times that, and then I'm going to add in the power series correction here. Okay, so what we can see now is that I get an infinite series multiplied against the Euler solution. In particular, what I get is a series solution that looks like this. Uh, An, pardon me, x minus x naught, 
to the power of n plus r. In this case, r is often referred to as the roots or the exponents at the singularity. So this isn't a traditional power series solution. This isn't the one that you have worked with because r could be anything, right? It could be, for example, it could be one half. It could be the square root of two. It could be three. It could be anything. So what this is, is sort of an augmented version of a power series. And the augmented version comes from our understanding of solutions to the Euler equation. All right, let's put the, the Frobenius method to use. Let's use it to solve a differential equation. In particular, we're going to solve 2x squared y double prime minus xy prime and then plus 1 plus x y is equal to 0. Okay, so you can check that x equal to 0 is a regular singular point. So let's say x equal to 0 is a regular singular point. Okay, so what you can do, you can easily check that just going back to the beginning of the lecture using those little limits. Now I've identified myself a regular singular point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and use the Frobenius method to find a series solution. So here's what I'll do. I'll say set y equal to the sum from n to infinity of a n x to the n plus r. Now this is, you know, if we remember how we did series solutions previously, Really, the name of the game is figuring out the ANs. Now you got a double whammy, right? The double piece here is figuring out the ANs, but also figuring out that exponent, R. We're going to see how this factors in, but this leads to things getting a little bit messier, right? So when we take a derivative here, we get R plus N, AN, X to the uh, N plus R. It doesn't really matter what the order is here. And a second derivative, y double prime, n equal to 0 to infinity, r plus n, uh, sorry, minus 1 here, r plus n minus 1, a n x to the n plus r minus 2. Now, I want you to be very careful. We don't know what r is, so we can't just rearrange the sum and start counting at 1 or 2 instead like we did for uh, regular points. So what can we do? Well, what we could do is we could put this into the differential equation. Let's use a different color for that. Let's say put into the ODE. Okay, so in this case, the ODE is zero. I'm going to keep that off to the left, right? That's this thing equal to zero. Now let's Put it all in 2x squared times y double prime the x squared is going to add 2 to that exponent that's nice so i get the sum from n equal to 0 to infinity now how would we like to write this 2 a n r plus n r plus n minus 1 and this is going to be x to the power of r plus n that's just the y double prime term. So you can see this is going to get pretty hectic pretty quickly. Minus, now x times y prime, that's nice. It's going to help us out with that exponent too. So minus the sum from n equal to 0 to infinity of r plus n, a n, uh, x to the r plus n. And then you've got this term that's being multiplied in, this 1 plus x term. We're going to multiply 1 in, and then we're going to add it to x multiplied in. So there's going to be two more terms down here. Let's take a look at what they are. The first one is just y, because it's y times 1. And the second one, we're going to add 1 to that exponent, because it's being multiplied by x. Okay, first things first, okay? So I'm going to make this note without writing a whole other line, okay? Just so that I can keep things 
you know, a little bit manageable. But this thing is the same as starting at one, where I have a n minus one, x to the r plus n. Okay, so all I did was I brought down the power because look it, everybody's got an x to the r plus n except for this one. And remember, the name of the game is putting all of these things together and figuring out a recurrence relation for the ANs. So we need everybody to have the same generic term if we're going to be able to do that. Okay, let's go back. Let's clean it up. Now, everybody starts at zero except this one. They all have the same generic term, but this one starts counting at one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull n equal to zero out of the first three sums, and then everybody can start counting at n equal to one, and I can put them all together. So let's do it. Let's see what happens here. Pull the n equal to zero term out of this thing, I get a naught. I'm gonna get a naught coming out of all of them, that's why I'm going to do a naught times something. And then two times r plus zero. So two times r uh, plus zero and then r plus zero minus one. So I'm just really sort of emphasizing to you that n equal to zero is here. And then minus r plus zero, again, pulling out the n equal to zero solution, and the a zero has already been factored out. And in this case, all I'm getting is one because the a zero has been factored out. And then, Plus, now I've got a big ugly sum starting from one to infinity. I can now put everybody together. Let's see what happens here. It's gonna be enormous. So I've got two and then r plus n, r plus n minus one, and then minus r plus n, and then plus one, and that's all multiplied by a n and then plus a n minus one. That's the end of the big bracket, then the generic term. And remember this whole thing is equal to zero. Okay, so let's take a look at what we have. First things first, we know that this whole sum is equal to zero. It tells us every single one of the individual components in this sum have to be zero. So in particular, the first thing we get is what's called the initial equation. So the initial equation. This is the equation that's multiplied by a zero. Of course, we don't want a zero to be zero. We want to have the freedom to choose it. That means the rest of this thing is equal to zero. So this is two r times r minus one minus r plus one is equal to zero. Take a minute, pause the video, and look at that for a second. That looks a lot like what we saw in the last lecture on Euler equations. That looks like the characteristic equation associated with an Euler equation. In fact, it is, right? Remember, earlier in this video, I said that all of this is motivated by Euler equations. This initial equation is exactly the Euler equation that I showed you. And in particular, this thing has two roots one half and one. And that's going to give you two different solutions of this form. One of them is gonna be augmented by a half, one of them is gonna be augmented by one. So these things, these R values are called the exponents at the singularity. Now remember the singularity is x equal to zero. These are the exponents that come from that Euler equation corresponding to how we sort of set this thing up before we erase the board and started with the example. Okay, so now there's another piece of this and there's also what we call the recurrence relation. So the recurrence relation and that is when this thing is equal to zero. So let's put it in a different color so it really pops. This is going to be two, 
and then r plus n, r plus n minus 1, and then minus r plus n uh, plus 1, and then all of this is multiplied by a n, and then plus a n minus 1 is equal to 0. Something interesting to note is that this is a first order difference equation now. If you look back at your notes at what happened when we did this for uh, regular points, not singular points, we always got a second order equation and it gave us this freedom of a0 and a1 to get two solutions. Now we already have that freedom. We have that freedom with the exponents at, the, at infinity. That gives us two different solutions, one for each value of r. So this is good. The, the first order nature of this tells us we won't have a degeneracy for say a0 and a1. Okay, let's rearrange this thing. Tells us that our current coefficient is the negative of the previous one divided by two times r plus n uh, squared and then minus three times r plus n and plus one. So all I did is I sort of simplified this a little bit so that I could multiply it out, make it look a little prettier, and that's what I get. And this holds for all n greater than or equal to one. Remember, it's starting counting at one now, not zero, but that's okay. This sort of makes me starting at a zero. Okay, so let's do r1 is equal to one. So. Let's do the, the larger exponent here at the singularity. In this case, a n is equal to, so we can simplify this up really nicely. And in fact, this becomes, so you can actually put r equal to one into this. You can, you can simplify it. You get n times two n plus one. Okay, now it's sort of back to what we've been doing for a long time. Because now it's putting in values of n and it's looking for a pattern here. So a1 is equal to minus a0 divided by, I'm going to always write these things in all of the multiples because typically we're seeing factorials jump out. It's nice to be able to see all the multiplications that are going in to building these factorials. In this case, a2 is equal to minus a1 divided by 2 times 5. Now we know what a1 is. This becomes a0 over 1 times 2 times 3 times 5. So it's not quite a, a, a factorial. It's a 5 factorial on the bottom there. So I want you to be careful with that. In fact, I'm going to group these things so that the 3 times 5, which is coming from the 2n plus 1 term, and then the 1 times 2, which is coming from the n term. Similarly, a3 in this case, minus a2 divided by 3 times 7, which is equal to minus a0, and then 1 times 2 times 3, and then 3 times 5 times 7. So it's all the odd numbers being multiplied up, and then you have a factorial as well. And so I think we have enough data to figure out what our actual uh, solution to this thing is. If not, there is no shame in doing a few more. You know, go up as high as you need until you can really figure out what that pattern is. This is n factorial and then times 3 times 5 times 7 all the way up to 2n uh, plus 1. Right, so it's all of these odd numbers being multiplied together. And in fact, this is a really frustrating way to write this. It makes for a very messy uh, uh, system here. In fact, what we can do is we can multiply the top and bottom by the missing even numbers. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say multiply uh, top and bottom. Well, what do I need? I need a two. So by two times four times six, and then all the way up to two n. But I can actually factor that. I get 
2, I take a 2 out of the first term, then I can take a 2 out of the second term, a 2 out of the third term, all the way up until I just get 1 to n being multiplied in. And how many 2's did I take out? I took out 1 for every number, so 2 to the n, which is 2 to the n times n factorial. But what happens now? I put this on the top and the bottom. This is going to give me minus 1 to the n, a0. The n factorial on the top is going to cancel there. And so I've got a 2 to the n that floats through. And on the bottom, I multiply this in just so I could get a proper factorial. 2n plus 1 factorial. And so I've got one solution now. So therefore, y1 of x is equal to, okay, so what do I have? I have this thing right here. I'm going to open it up a little bit so you can really get a nice view of it. This is my a0 term, right? a0 factors out of everybody. This is the n equal to 0 term. So I just isolated it again so I can really emphasize this Frobenius part. And now an infinite sum starting from 1 to infinity because I pulled out the n equal to 0, minus 1 to the n, 2 to the n, divided by 2n plus 1 factorial times x to the n. Okay, now, as you can see, I don't have a whole lot of room here. I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you. But when, R, when you use R is equal to 1 half, it goes into this recurrence relation. You, get, you sub R equal to 1 half in here. You're going to have to solve for that. And in fact, you get a really nice form for your, your solution. So you get the x to the 1 half. That's the sort of new little Frobenius part that comes out. And then 1 plus this infinite sum from n equal to n equal to 1 to infinity. Uh, very, very similar looking. Minus 1 to the n, uh, 2 to the n over 2n factorial, and then times x to the n. So very, very similar looking, but again, I really want to emphasize to you this weird part that's out front. Because if you really sort of write that as a power series, the first term in your power series is a square root of x. That is pretty strange, right? That comes from the fact that you're using singular points now. And we had to take advantage of the fact that when you look around the singularity for these things, well, it starts to look like an Euler equation, and that's where we get this characteristic equation or this indicial equation for our uh, roots or for our exponents at infinity are coming out. Okay, so it's a little bit more nuanced, but mostly it's a lot of the same, right? This is really only the new piece to it, but it proceeds in a very, very similar way to what we've seen before. And I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you, but you can actually show that both of these have infinite radius of convergence. That means that these power series solutions, they converge for every single value of x. And the way you can do that is just using the ratio test. We have a general form for the coefficients. They're right here and right here. Just use the ratio test. You can show that that thing goes to 0, that a n plus 1 over a n which tells you that you converge for every single value of x. Okay, when we come back in the next lecture, we're going to keep talking about these regular singular points, and we're going to sort of further explore some examples.